the turn of the century, Britain was the world's leading maritime nation. And Clydebank, in the southwest of Scotland, was the epicenter of British shipbuilding. Some of the most famous ocean liners ever to set sail had their origins here. Ships such as the Lusitania and Aquitania. But at the height of the Great Depression, Clydebank was a tomb. And little symbolized the economic crisis more dramatically than the locked gates of the John Brown shipyard. Behind them, the abandoned and rusting hulk of the largest ship in the world the Queen Mary, 80% complete. The world's leading maritime nation was on its knees. Despite the tough economic times, other nations were earning profits and prestige for their large, powerful liners. The Italian liner Rex and the German superliners Bremen and Europa had all left Britain in their wake by taking the highly prized Blue Ribbon for the fastest ship on the North Atlantic. To make matters worse, across the English Channel, the French government had underwritten the construction of a giant ocean liner of similar proportions to the Queen Mary. At 79,000 tonnes, the Normandy would give France the largest ship in the world and the travelling public the most elegant ocean liner ever created. With Britain's reputation as the world's leading maritime nation at stake, the British government intervened in the crisis and work began again on the Queen Mary. When the Mary was being built and the Normandy was being built, their pictures were constantly in all the major papers of the world. Uh, anything that happened to them was news, number one news. The French and the British were now locked into an extraordinary duel for dominance of the North Atlantic. A duel between the two largest and fastest ships the world had ever seen. On a cold, rain-soaked day six months later, more than 200,000 people gathered to see British royalty lend its presence to the launching rituals of a merchant ship. I was standing halfway down the berth at the side of the ship with my nerves on edge. <laughs> James McNeil, my boss, he was standing away down on the other side of the ship, a good bit further down the yard. He was biting his nails. I am happy to name this ship the Queen Mary. And now the 40,000 ton hull of the Royal Mail steamer Queen Mary glides down the slipway, cheered all the way by quarter of a million people. As the Queen Mary plunged into the River Clyde, she appeared to be gathering speed. Too much speed. The crowd fell silent, sensing disaster. The cables tauten as the 2,500 tons of drag chains take up the strain. Surely a tribute to British engineering is the fact that without the slightest hitch, the launch is accomplished. I see both of us <laughs> kicking our fingers crossed that all would be well. Very relieved when it was. In late May 1935, the pride of France set out on her maiden voyage from Le Havre. The Normandie, giant luxury liner of all the seas, carrying 3,000 souls, is a veritable floating city. The world has waited for this moment. 
And the question asked again and again is, will this 80,000 ton streamlined giant wrest the blue ribbon of the Atlantic from the German liner Bremen? The French line said in 1935, we are definitely not going for the blue ribbon. It's not in the making. We'll do it later on. They would not admit to it for fearing something mechanically could backfire. As Normandy sailed for New York, she carried the hopes of her countrymen that she'd be the first French ship to win the Blue Ribbon of the Atlantic. For the next four days, Normandy became the floating headquarters of Parisian society. In the favorable sailing conditions, Normandy averaged almost 29 knots and immediately proved herself a thoroughbred. The Blue Ribbon was hers for the taking. When Normandy came into the port of New York for the first time in June of 1935, every window, every building, every roof is black with people. With the fireboats leading the reception, New York Harbor roars, toots, whistles, and shrieks a pandemonium of wealth. All records shattered as the Normandy makes the crossing in four days, three hours, and 14 minutes. Greatest of liners on the most acclaimed maiden voyage in the history of navigation. Well, of course, she captured the Blue Ribbon on her maiden voyage. And everyone was given a bronze medallion, Blue Ribbon Normandy, and it said Made in France, so they knew all along they were going to try for it. Twelve months later, with her fitting out complete, the Queen Mary was ready to challenge her French rival. The liner's hotel-like interiors were modern, but not too modern. Elegant, but not gaudy. But the reaction of the British critics was mixed. In the opinion of one London columnist, the design of her public rooms, her bars and her restaurants seem to have been aimed at dollar millionaires from the Midwest of America and their opposite numbers in England, who claim that where there's muck, there's money. But such criticisms did little to dampen the enthusiasm of Englishmen who looked upon their new maritime prodigy with pride touched with awe. And even the Queen, who gave the ship her name, was privately relieved. She and about 19 members of the royal family went down to Southampton to see the fitted out, finished Queen Mary. All very art deco and, well, light years away from what the old queen liked, but nonetheless, she toured it with interest. She went back that night to Windsor Castle and she wrote, toured the new Queen Mary today, not as bad as I expected. The day of her maiden voyage had arrived and no other ship in British maritime history seemed so important to the nation's prestige. At four o'clock, she said, about three o'clock, they asked me to take a message over to the head office ashore. And <laughs> I thought, well, normally just go down the gangway, cross. I think it took me nearly an hour to get through the crowd. You had to push your way through, and everybody was pulling at you like a pop star, you know. I, they didn't know about pop stars then. They were tugging at you. Can I have a button? They were trying to pull your buttons. So that's how it went, you know, really. It was quite, it was quite a thing. Hearts will glow with admiration when our new liner leaves the key. And a name loved by the nation will give her charm and dignity. British labor gave it skill. As the Queen Mary set out on her maiden voyage to New York, the fog of depression that had blanketed Britain for more than five years seemed to lift. I booked my trip for the USA, so when I go over the sea, the Queen Mary takes me. Throughout the voyage, conversations turned to the Queen's stunning progress.
and the inevitability of her capturing the Blue Ribbon from Normandy. Only a day out of New York, a fog of the Atlantic kind engulfed the Queen Mary. Cunard was so very worried, Titanic always loomed in the background, fog, see, so she slowed right down. And she slowed down for probably half the day. She lost the mileage. And it was a big, big disappointment. Everybody's a little bit disappointed about that. When the fog finally lifted, the Queen Mary powered towards New York at 33 knots, a speed faster than any other liner in history. She made up time, but not enough. Less than an hour out of New York, the honor of winning the Blue Ribbon slipped from her grasp. A sea of ships around, boats, yachts, rowing boats, anything that could float. And then she went up the Hudson, a ticker tape welcome for her. Fantastic. There's nothing really, I think, has been seen like that ever since, not for a liner. The coming of the Queen Mary inaugurates one of the greatest races of all time. Which ship will turn out to be the faster, the Normandy or the Queen? That is the question of the hour. Here is Commodore Sir Edgar Britton. Are you going to try for the Blue Ribbon, Captain? Well, naturally, that's what we're out for. What did we build her for? In the 1930s, New York was the busiest port in the world, and the most glamorous. On any day, a dozen of the world's most prestigious liners could be tied up beside each other. And in those tight money times, competition was stiff for the hearts and minds of the traveling public. In the newsreels of the day, the comings and goings of liners and the celebrities who traveled on them became a cliche in itself. But the reporters got a color story for the next edition, and the stars and the shipping lines got welcomed publicity. Some lines even made passenger lists available to the media to ensure cameras would be pointing in their direction rather than at the competition. Crossing the gangway, so the brochures promised, one would immediately sense the glamour, romance and sheer fun of life on board one of the largest moving objects ever built. And of course the lines embellish this through artwork and posters of the big bow surging through the Atlantic waves as they charge their way across the seas. You know, you could just picture this huge muscle power down below churning, working those propellers as the ship made its way. Ships' officers created a gala atmosphere with games and diversions to keep their passengers' minds off the one aspect of ocean travel never advertised. My first trip alone, after I'd been a movie star and had some money, I came to Europe all by myself on the Queen Mary. And I always got terribly seasick on ocean liners. And uh, they didn't have any Dramamine in those days, or they didn't have anything for you. You just had to eat celery, and they said to drink a little champagne, none of which did any good at all. The elegant salons and dining rooms were designed to help passengers forget about the rolling Atlantic and make the best of the $700 first-class ticket. You had to have a different dress for every night. Men were in clover, they wore the same dinner jackets. But uh, we had things for the morning, then we had afternoon clothes after the nap, and then we dressed for dinner. We had a lot of clothes with us. Well, we, we were with steamer trunks. All these rich people and all these celebrities, when they came down into Turkish bath and took their clothes off, they were just ordinary people like me. I mean, I, we were all naked. 
And we told stories and we drank pints of beer. I think half of them love to be down there because they're away from their wives. Only months after her maiden voyage, the Queen Mary captured the Blue Ribbon from Normandy and became the first ship to make the Atlantic crossing in less than four days, averaging more than 30 knots. The following year, Normandy regained the prize with two record-breaking crossings. On the second, she averaged 31.2 knots. Then, in 1937, the Queen Mary pushed the speed barrier even further to 31.6 knots, a record that wouldn't be bettered for nearly 15 years. In the great race between the superliners of the 1930s, the Queen Mary won out over her rivals, not only in speed, but in profits. The Normandy, as lavish and as wonderful as it was, was a, a little bit of overkill. A lot of people who might have booked it said, gee, I don't know if we'll fit in on the Normandy. It's just a little too luxurious, a little too posh, a little too over the edge. So we'll go on a less pretentious ship. And it's interesting that the only success of the 30s of that inner breed of superliners was the Queen Mary, because she had a wonderful sort of British sense of unpretension, coziness, good service, the whole bit that made it work. And she was the only successful giant of the 30s. In Germany, by the mid-1930s, the darkness of depression had lifted to be replaced by the long shadow of Nazism. Soon after he came to power, Adolf Hitler sent his people back to work on grand national projects. As well as creating the finest infrastructure in Europe, Hitler saw Germany as a powerhouse of industry, trade and finance. But in his vision for Germany, there was no place for trade unions, the breeding ground for dissent. So he outlawed them and forced all workers to join the state-controlled German labor front. But how to win over the hearts and minds of the workers to Hitler's fascist ideals? The propaganda division of the Third Reich came up with the idea of offering inexpensive holiday voyages to workers, especially those who were members of the Nazi party. They called the scheme Strength Through Joy. The aim was to give the German workers the opportunity to relax. For most of the passengers, it was their first encounter with the sea and a chance to visit exotic destinations few Germans ever thought possible of seeing. Wherever they went, the ships were diplomats of the Third Reich. This stopover at Naples was greeted with wild enthusiasm and signified the growing relationship between fascist Italy and Germany. The German government was very interested to, uh, to get a better image outside because uh, there were great uh, opposition in many countries against the Nazi government and they tried to bring uh, more uh, positive image to uh, the foreign world. So, for instance, the great uh, uh, Olympic Games in 1936 were one of these uh, cases and the uh, Strength and Joy uh, ships were one also of these uh, projects which were used in this way. Strength Through Joy cruisers became so popular, the German Labour Front commissioned the construction of two new liners. The 28,000 tonne Wilhelm Gustloff, launched in 1937, was the world's first specially built cruise ship. She was a one-class ship, and the first ever to offer the same standard of accommodation for crew and guests. Egalitarianism had come to the high seas. Two years later, Adolf Hitler sailed on the maiden voyage of the second liner in the series, the Robert Ley. Propaganda cameras were also aboard, 
capturing the Führer's rapport with passengers and crew alike. Of course, the Nazi party here made propaganda with it because they really had something to offer to the people and now they wanted that the people knew who built the ships for them and who, to whom they had to be grateful for it. Strength through joy gave German workers an ocean-going inducement to continue their support for Hitler. Before long, however, the fine music from the ship's orchestras would be drowned out by the drums of war. Another catastrophe was in the making, and joy would be in short supply for the duration. In late September 1938, as the clouds of war began to engulf Europe, Queen Elizabeth arrived at the John Brown shipyard in Glasgow to launch a running mate for the Queen Mary. In front of 300,000 people, the Queen took the opportunity to rally Britons to the cause of peace, not war. We proclaim our belief that by the grace of God and by man's patience and goodwill, order may yet be brought out of confusion and peace out of turmoil. With that hope and prayer in our hearts, we send forth upon her mission this noble ship. At 83 and a half thousand tons, and a thousand and thirty feet in length, the Queen Elizabeth would supersede all before her in size. Along with the Queen Mary, she'd give her owners, Cunard White Star, its long-awaited two-ship weekly service to New York. In less than a minute, the largest ship in the world arrived in her natural element. But she would not see service for the purpose she was built, for another seven long years. Dawn on the 1st of September 1939. For the new German armies and air force, a baptism of fire. As the tanks of the fatherland rolled into Poland, Germany ignited the Second World War. At Glasgow, that same fateful morning, 1,400 passengers boarded an Anchor Donaldson Line steamer, the Athenia, bound for Montreal. Two days later, the day Britain declared war on Germany, the Athenia crossed paths with a German U-boat 250 miles northwest of Ireland. Despite an order from the commander of the U-boat fleet, Admiral Donuts, not to attack unarmed passenger liners, the U-boat captain gave chase. The Athenia sank in 20 minutes with the loss of 112 passengers, including several Americans. The survivors were picked up by freighters and ferried to safety. Facing international condemnation, Germany denied responsibility for the sinking. Eyewitness reports told a different story. We saw the submarine to a left a distance of about 200 yards. We saw it for a considerable time. There's no doubt about being a submarine. For Germany, the Athenia sinking was a propaganda disaster and it proved that from day one of the war, that liners and their passengers weren't going to be exempt from the carnage. Like the First World War, this conflict was total war. The war at sea comes to the Atlantic coast of America. The US cruiser Tuscaloosa and a sister ship are on patrol. A radio message comes from the giant German luxury liner Columbus 
that she has met a British cruiser, and the Tuscaloosa is speeding to witness the inglorious end of one of Germany's proudest ships. The Pathé Gazette now shows you more than is seen even by the Tuscaloosa's captain. We take you aboard the doomed German liner. Each member of the crew is at his station as the lifeboats go over the side. While they are lowered, others are spreading benzene throughout the ship. When almost all are safely in the lifeboats shoving off from the vessel, a suicide squad of 10 and the captain start the fires and open the sea valves, and Germany's 32,000-ton liner Columbus begins to burn. These scuttlings can mean only one thing, that in his own mind, Hitler has already lost the war. His hopes are fading in pillars of smoke and fire at sea. If Hitler had lost the war, nobody had told the German Luftwaffe. They were soon hunting enemy naval and merchant ships and enforcing Hitler's blockade of Britain. British Admiralty feared the Luftwaffe would soon have their sights fixed on the giant shipbuilding centre on Glasgow's River Clyde, where the world's largest liner, the Queen Elizabeth, was still being fitted out. Her escape was to be one of the most daring of the war. Certain that spies were in the area, a deliberate rumour was spread that the liner would be sailing to Southampton for dry docking. But her real destination was unknown to all on board, even the captain. Well, I, I think all they were told was to take clothes for a possibly absence on the ship for a bit. But they didn't know where they were going. At sea, Captain Townley opened sealed orders. The destination, New York. As she sped across the North Atlantic, Nazi bombers were spotted over the Solent, precisely where she would have been sailing en route to Southampton. It was a dramatic escape, especially for a ship that had never been to sea before. And there was still launch gear fixed beneath the water. She'd had no engine trials, she'd had no trials of any kind. Her sea trials were crossing at speed, evading U-boats across the North Atlantic. She arrived unannounced. The Coast Guardsman standing on the beach out at Fire Island suddenly saw what he described as a great gray ghost coming out of the mist, and it was the Queen Elizabeth. It was the first time the maiden voyage of such an important liner had gone unheralded. Next to that of the Titanic, it would have to rate as one of the most dramatic maiden voyages in history. At New York, the Queen Elizabeth found herself in good company. And she and the Mary and the Normandy, the three monsters, the longshoremen call them, tied up in New York for two weeks together in March of 1940. And it was a low point of the war for the Allies because the low countries were being overrun. France was about to surrender. And then the Queen Mary went to war. In mid-April 1940, after a four-week voyage from New York, the Queen Mary sailed through Sydney Heads. Over the next two weeks, Australian ship workers would transform the luxury liner into a troop ship. She was joined in Sydney by six other British liners, including the new Mauritania and the First World War veteran Aquitania. Together, they were to make the first great armada of the Second World War. The liners were soon packed with 14,000 Australian and New Zealand soldiers prepared to sail to the other side of the globe to fight yet another war for their king and empire. The Queen Mary was the largest and fastest troop ship the world had yet seen 
and her impressive departure couldn't have gone unnoticed by fifth columnists in Sydney. If she came to grief at the hands of a U-boat, it would be a propaganda coup for Germany. The voyage would take more than five weeks to reach Scotland, its speed dictated by the slowest of the vessels. Everyone involved was conscious of both the risks and the importance of the mission to the survival of Britain. When you're down below in a ship, in the hull of a ship, and you're, you're normally in the lower part of the ship, and you can see the still structure of the ship there, and here's your bunk there, you think, cracky, death is, if a torpedo hits us there, I was frightened. After rounding the Cape of Good Hope, the convoy sailed north, but the liners were built for the bitter cold of the North Atlantic, not the stifling heat of equatorial waters. Unfortunately, the Aquitaine was not air conditioned. She was a hot ship. She stunk with heat. I mean, I used to sleep on the fire deck on a mattress. I never slept down, but it was too hot. And the Australians used to try and get onto the deck, so the whole upper structure of the ship was full of Australian soldiers and crew to get air. Terrible. What should have been a triumphant arrival in Britain was overshadowed by the news that France had offered its surrender to Germany only hours before. Hitler was soon standing on a French beach, casting his eye across the English Channel to Britain, a mere 20 miles away. Bombs were soon falling on London, and Britain was now facing one of the most dangerous periods in her long history. Despite the fear of a German invasion, Britain's new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, dispatched another fleet of liners carrying British troops away from their homeland. They were destined for the Middle East, where Italy had opened up another front. For nearly 100 years, British liners had sustained the empire. Now they were fighting for its very survival. At stake, the Suez Canal, a lifeline for vital supplies from her dominions. Convoys also arrived at Suez from Australia and New Zealand. But by late 1940, it was clear that to have any hope of survival, Britain needed more fighting men and even more ships to carry them. In November that year, the largest ship in the world, the Queen Elizabeth, slipped out of New York Harbour to join the Queen Mary, shuttling troops from Australia to the Middle East. The America she was leaving was staying out of the conflict. But the next time she visited, the United States would be at war. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Within hours of declaring war on Japan, President Roosevelt seized the French liner Normandy and ordered her to be transformed as quickly as possible into a troop ship. When I came out of the subway, the entire sky was brown from the smoke of the Normandy. During her conversion into a troop transport, fire breaks out in the 83,000 ton liner Normandy recently renamed Lafayette. Thousands of workers had to flee for their lives as flames roared through the one-time French luxury liner. The dockside at New York Harbor is cleared as firemen and apparatus from all over Manhattan fight the stubborn blaze that rages for four hours. Not sabotage, I wonder. The Normandy wasn't done in by a German saboteur. She was done in by sheer carelessness. Men were cutting 
a cutting job in the Grand Salon, and the man holding the asbestos shield took it away a fraction of a second too early, and white-hot fragments fell onto Kapok life preservers bundled in tarred paper and new burlap, and they started to burn. While the fire was contained to the top three decks, a new danger presented itself. The closing of the fireproof doors prevented the escape of thousands of tons of water poured into her from the fire hoses. Gradually, Normandy became top heavy and took on a dangerous list. I found uh, Vladimir Yorkovich in the crowd. He was the designer of the hull of the ship. And uh, he had just been to Admiral Adolphus Andrews, who was the Navy man in charge. And he told me, he said, I, I told him that let me on board. I can find the seacocks blindfolded. I will open the seacocks. The ship will sink three feet and be perfectly level. She will not tip over. Andrew said, this is a Navy job. And that was the end of the Normandy. You can't imagine the size of this monster laying on its side. She looked like some big whale that just rolled over in the berth. But some people, I think, came down at it one time and sailed there, and just to look at her and damn near cry that she was gone. It, it was a, a disaster that did not happen, have to happen. And it also deprived us of, of one of the greatest troop ships in the world for World War II. And we needed troop ships right at that time. Nine days after the loss of the Normandy, the Queen Mary was flying the American flag and carrying her troops to the other side of the globe. Their task? To begin the battle for the Asia-Pacific and help defend Northern Australia, which by now was under Japanese attack. Her troop carrying capacity had been increased from 5,000 to 8,000, and her defenses upgraded to fend off enemy raiders. During the voyage, the Queen Mary had two close encounters with U-boats. Off the Brazilian coast, the ship's wireless operator picked up a bizarre German radio report. The radio officer ran up to the wheelhouse and he said, Captain, Captain, I've just overheard Berlin Radio has announced that we've just been sunk and all 15,000 on board have drowned. To which the captain says, how interesting, but don't tell the boys they'll get upset. The 40-day, 18,000-mile voyage from Boston to Sydney via South Africa ranks as one of the greatest expeditions in American military history, and it was not the last. Thanks, Mr. Roosevelt, it's swell of you. All the way you're helping us to carry on. Over the next two years, more than one million Americans would arrive in Australia, a country with a pre-war population of only seven million. There was something about them that they, uh, they were a little more giving, a little more attentive, I think, than Australian men. And they also found that we were a little different to American women. More appreciative we were, I think. And our mothers loved them. <laughs> Depleted of its own fighting men, the influx was to have an extraordinary effect on Australian culture a culture that was 20 years behind in fashion, attitudes and sophistication. We're saying thanks, Mr. Roosevelt, we're proud of you. All the way you're helping us to carry on. In November 1942, the greatest armada in history sailed from Britain and the United States. Codenamed Operation Torch, the top secret expedition involved 170 warships and 350 merchant ships crammed with American and British troops. Their aim, to make an all-out assault on the German and Italian forces in North French Africa. The convoy was timed to land just as the American congressional elections were taking place. The American president hoped its success would influence the result. But the landing was delayed by four days 
and the domestic propaganda value to President Roosevelt was lost. In the strategy of global war, Operation Torch was a brilliant success. It supplied the enormous manpower and machinery that would push the Axis armies from the African continent and give the Allies a major morale-boosting victory. Out of the desert, out of Cairo, there has come tonight the news for which we have been waiting. The Axis forces in the desert are in full retreat. There's no shadow of doubt about it. The enemy are on the run, and we are after them. The Second World War wasn't just sustained by ships, they were the vital factor. The greatest movement of troop ships was on the dangerous North Atlantic, from the United States to Britain, supplying much-needed troops who would finally turn the tables on Germany in the battle for Europe. But the convoys were slow and prime targets for German U-boats. On the high seas in those deadly days, Vigilance was the price of life. Only two troopers seemed to be naturally immune to the undersea raiders, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. For most of the war, they sailed without escort and out of convoy, between them ferrying one and a quarter million men around the globe. The Germans were not able to intercept these ships because they were too fast for the submarines. Uh, there were very few cases when a German submarine even saw some of these big ships and there was never a possibility to make a real attack against one of these big ships. Carrying 15,000 troops in one voyage, now you can soon, you know, on a five-day trip, um, bring whole armies over, and that's precisely what those two ships did. It isn't surprising that in his memoirs, Winston Churchill um, pays great tribute to those two, two ships and goes so far as to say that in his judgment, uh, they probably clipped at least two years off the length of the Second World War. Tremendous historical impact of two big artifacts, if you like. In the Second World War, thousands of merchant ships from both sides were destroyed. Amongst the victims, some of the world's most renowned liners. I was stationed on the 39 Squadron in Italy, near a town called Termoli. Well, that started quite early in the day when we were suddenly told that we were to stand by in readiness to sink the Italian liner Rex. The Germans, were supposed to be sailing her out of Trieste Harbour and it was believed that they were going to sink her in the harbour mouth as a block ship to prevent um, any of our ships from getting into the harbour. This was all that we knew. And we were just above the treetops and then quite suddenly the ground fell away and below us was the coast. And there we saw the wrecks, our target. She was 51,000 tons, of course, and an infinitely bigger target than we were accustomed to. Once we had lined up on her, the Mustangs went in first of all to strafe any ak, -AK positions. And then we came in firing rockets, of course. Between our eight aircraft, 64 rockets were fired into her. And by that time, by the time we turned away, there were clouds of smoke coming up from her full length. The splendid flagship of the Italian Merchant Marine, a holder of the blue ribbon of the Atlantic, was lost to the world. Adolf Hitler's strength through joy ship, the Wilhelm Gustloff, was torpedoed by a Russian submarine in late January 1945 she was crammed with thousands of refugees and wounded soldiers. 
It was torpedoed and sank in less than 20 minutes, and 5,900 people perished, which is so much greater than the Titanic, and that is the greatest loss of life ever in history, to be lost at sea, and especially on a passenger ship. And yet the Wilhelm Gustloff is not even known outside of, say, Germany even. Another staggering casualty was the German liner Capacona, once the largest and fastest passenger ship on the South American run. She was lost in a British air attack only days before the end of the war. Stranded without fuel, she and another ship nearby were easy targets for British warplanes. Records recovered from the wreck confirmed that more than 8,000 people mainly prisoners from concentration camps were on the two ships. It's believed more than 7,000 people perished in the incident. At least 5,000 were on board the Capacona. It was a crazy and absolutely crazy thing which can only be explained from both sides with that special atmosphere in the very last days of the Second World War. The Second World War was, as we all know, the war with the aim of a total devastation of the enemy from both sides. It was a total war par excellence. For many liners and their crews, war duties were far from over. There were millions of battle-weary troops, POWs and war brides to deliver safely to the four corners of the globe. Without Britain's extraordinary fleet of liners, the outcome of the Second World War may have been markedly different for the Allies. The ability to move great numbers of troops fast was an essential ingredient of global war. Airplanes could never do it. So it had to be the liner. The liner did make global war much more practical and possible. At the end of the war, Britain's preeminent shipping line, Cunard, set about re-establishing its dominance of the North Atlantic. By late 1946, the Queen Elizabeth had been transformed from a war machine to a floating palace. With thousands of passengers aboard, including 50 millionaires, she set out on her first peacetime voyage. Russia's Mr. Molotov aboard, the Queen Elizabeth noses her way into New York's Hudson River. End of a trip that made sea history, and the famous New York skyline sees the world's biggest ship flying a British pennant. The following year, the Queen Mary joined the Queen Elizabeth on their long-awaited twice-weekly service from Southampton to New York. Queens were these huge dollar earners. America fell in love with a transatlantic travel, which had been denied throughout the war. Suddenly they had these two splendid ships, fast, big, smart, stylish ships. And uh, the Mary and the Elizabeth made a fortune. But on the North Atlantic in the late 1940s, the demand for speed and passenger comfort left little place for liners like the antiquated Aquitania. In 1950, she left Southampton on her final voyage, bound for the shipbreakers. She had survived service as a troop ship in two global conflicts, but wouldn't be around for the next war, a war already feared in the minds of military strategists, particularly in America there was the cloud of possibly World War III lingering in the sky. And would we need a big troop ship? Because we'd leased the Queens during the war to carry the GIs. Should we have a troop ship of our own? So the Truman government said, yes, let's go ahead and build one.
America's newest challenge for world supremacy and merchant marine is launched at Newport News. Senator Tom Connolly's wife wielding the bottle of champagne. For their money, the Pentagon insisted on three prime ingredients for the United States. Safety, speed, and quick conversion to a military troop ship. Her massive turbines were designed for aircraft carriers. And on paper, she was 40% more powerful than the Queen Mary. In July 1952, she set out on her maiden voyage with the Blue Ribbon directly in her sights. After clipping 10 hours off the Queen Mary's Atlantic crossing record, the United States' fastest liner in the world proudly approaches Le Havre to make her first docking in Europe and the French turn out to give a royal welcome to the new Queen of the Atlantic. The United States averaged more than 35 and a half knots, cutting almost half a day off the sailing time across the Atlantic. For the first time in a hundred years, America had proven itself a serious competitor on the most important sea lane in the world. It was such a phenomenal ship. It was a symbol of Yankee genius at that time. World's safest, world's fastest, one of the world's largest, convertible to troop ship in a matter of two days. I mean, it was a stunning tour de force, a centerpiece of American productivity in that high water period of the 1950s. In the decade following the war, competition soared on the North Atlantic. Anyone who was anyone had their favorite ship. And again, the lines capitalized on their allegiances as they offered their opinions to newsreel cameras. I just want to tell you that it's been a wonderful trip on this uh, United States. It was a great, great trip. That's a beautiful ship. And I understand the Canard Line gave it a 21 torpedo salute when it came in today. According to Cunard, Getting there was half the fun, and more people than ever could afford to travel just for the sake of it. But despite the optimism of the times, there was trouble ahead for the liners. A new threat was lurking in the skies above. In October 1958, the first commercial jet began a regular transatlantic service to London. Suddenly, the crossing could be measured in hours, not days. Within the year, more people would be flying the Atlantic than sailing. And on some voyages, crews would be outnumbering passengers, even on the luxurious Queens. Throughout its extraordinary history, the ocean liner had been one of the great symbols of the industrial age. Now a new age was dawning, and the ocean liner faced possible extinction. But the great race for dominance of the sea was far from over. A new race was about to begin. <laughs> 